Hello, my name is Sean Spear. I'm the project co-director of the Ontario 360 project at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. As, as viewers know, we've been publishing policy papers on a wide range of issues uh, related to Ontario's post-pandemic recovery. Uh, we've published papers over the past several weeks on topics ranging from fiscal federalism to a long-term growth strategy uh, to issues in and around the skilled trades uh, and lifelong learning. And I'm, I'm pleased to report that uh, this week is no different. Uh, Ontario 360 was proud to partner with the Spr Smart Prosperity Institute housed at the University of Ottawa to publish a new paper on the state of manufacturing in the province of Ontario and the case for a provincial manufacturing strategy. And I'm pleased to be here today uh, with the authors of that paper, along with my project co-director, Drew Fagan, to talk a bit about um, the research and analysis outlined in the paper, uh, which, by the way, for viewers, is entitled Made in Ontario, Provincial Manufacturing Strategy. Uh, and so let's get into the conversation. Um, to start, let me introduce you to the authors. Um, the paper um, was, pub was written by uh, Mike Moffat, uh, John McNally, and Alini Catino. Um, and uh, they're going to share their thoughts and insights with us about uh, what's happened um, in Ontario's manufacturing sector, why policymakers ought to care, and what we can do um, to bolster manufacturing in Ontario. And, and as always, I'm here with my wingman um, and partner in crime, uh, Drew Fagan, who's, an, who's a professor of practice at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. So maybe just to start uh, the conversation, um, Mike, John, and Alini, um, can, can you give viewers a sense of what's happened in manufacturing, say, over the past 20 years or so, both in terms of employment, um, but but also output, because I think the uh, that's a useful starting point to understand, um, you know, why we ought to care about manufacturing and what we can do um, as policymakers to um, better support the sector. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to take that one. So starting around uh, 2000 or 2001, uh, when, when China joined the WTO, uh, the manufacturing landscape became far more competitive. And we saw across the Great Lakes region, so Ontario, Quebec, but as well, Michigan, New York, and so on, uh, big declines in manufacturing in employments. Uh, what essentially happened was, was either that, that firms closed, they changed jurisdictions, or in many cases, they automated. It, they, they sort of became the sort of automate or, or die. So between uh, about uh, 2001 and the start of the financial crisis in 2008, uh, Ontario lost close to a quarter million uh, manufacturing jobs. So I should point out that a lot of that was actually attrition. A lot of that was not necessarily unemployment, but firms uh, basically letting their older workers retire and then often uh, placing them with the uh, equipment and machinery. That was amplified somewhat uh, by uh, the high Canadian dollar starting in 2004 or, or so, the sort of Dutch disease problem. So. So the, both Ontario and Quebec had these sort of dual pressures on the manufacturing sector. Then we had the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. And that period, we, we lost even more manufacturing jobs, over 100,000 manufacturing jobs. And that primarily was through unemployment and, and, and firms closing. Since then, employment levels have been relatively flat, but that's a bit misleading because we've seen increases in output and increases in the value of output. So we've had this uh, continued uh, automation, this uh, continued uh, you know, high tech uh, part of manufacturing, in part because a lot of the sort of lower end, the more labor intensive parts of manufacturing simply simply didn't survive. So. Overall, we have a sector that's that's growing in economic terms, growing in output, becoming more competitive, but not necessarily creating a lot more net uh, new jobs. Uh, but the jobs that are being created are higher skill, often higher paid, uh, and higher levels of uh, education uh, necessary for those. And again, we see this, this is not 
unique to Ontario, we see the same thing in Quebec and uh, our U.S. Great Lake uh, state counterparts. So, so overall, you know, I think there's this uh, thinking out there that, that manufacturing sort of a dying industry, you know, facing all of the, these problems, but that view is about 10 or 12 years old, that yes, there, were, there was big um, disemployment between 2003 and 2009, but those days are largely gone, and we've got uh, we, we we've got a very resilient sector. I say if if manufacturers can survive that period between 2003 and 2009, they can survive just about anything. So we have a very strong sector in Ontario um, that's that's growing in economic terms and is competitive with with anyone uh, on the planet. Well, that I think uh, that context is important. Um, you know for laying the foundation for the, the rest of the paper's uh, uh, analysis and ultimately it, its recommendations. Um, you know, one of the things that viewers might, might be asking as they, as they learn more about the paper is, why should we care about manufacturing? You know, why, why should a policy preference manufacturing over, over other sectors or other parts of the economy? Um, and your arguments in favor of uh, preferencing manufacturing is pretty core um, to the insights and, and recommendations in the paper. So um, there, you set out several reasons why we ought to care about manufacturing, um, some of which are highly relevant in the context of COVID-19 and some of the challenges that we've had with respect to um, you know, supply of particular strategic goods. But maybe I'll just turn it to the three of you um, to give viewers a sense of, uh, in, your, in your minds, why we ought to care about uh, manufacturing um, as a, a source of employment um, and uh, opportunity in, in the province. So who wants to tackle that one? Who wants to go? Alini, do you want to go first? Sure. Just to, just to continue on, on, on Mike's thoughts, uh, despite all these changes, uh, manufacturing still remains uh, a central economic uh, um, sector in, in, in Ontario. So for, instru for uh, instance, uh, manufacturing um, in Ontario accounts for more or less 11% of the total employment in the commons. And in Ontario alone, we're talking about uh, half of the total uh, manufacturing uh, employment in Canada. So in Ontario, manufacturing is absolutely an important central uh, sector. So not only we're talking about, despite obviously the certain decline, historical decline in, in numbers of uh, employment, uh, we don't see uh, any more manufacturing using employment. It became somewhat stabilized. It is still quite significant. So we're talking about a source of employment, a sector source of employment, but also manufacturing has an immense capacity to uh, engage or create uh, innovation, right? Uh, we have transitioned to uh, durable, the production of durable goods that is highly dependent on uh, innovative, uh, you know, research and development, innovation, innovative practices to keep, remain, uh, uh, competitive. It's a massive source of uh, productivity, uh, you know, contributing to uh, gross domestic product. Uh, and not only that, the sort of innovations that happen within manufacturing have a tendency to spill over into other sectors. So it's, it's a type of sector that we tend to think that it's isolated from the economy, but actually what happens in manufacturing has a great capacity to uh, influence positively on other sectors leading to more productivity, more innovation ideas and, and new processes and things of the sort. So um, it's, it's, it's the revitalization of, um, of manufacturing uh, in, in, in Ontario will contribute in terms of, uh, you know, employment within the sector, but also uh, pushing or advancing economic growth uh, into other sectors as well. Not to mention that when we're talking about employment uh, opportunities in manufacturing, uh, it also, not only in terms of the spillovers, but the sort of incomes that are generated within the sector will be spent in other sectors as well. So it really contributes to the social 
and economic fabric of a uh, region. So that's why manufacturing is too important. And and if we could, um, let me just you know um, bounce off that a little bit because the paper is particularly data rich. Um, and I would say one of the areas where you really break ground is in the analysis of the province broadly and the province regionally. And the insights you bring into those areas of the province outside Greater Toronto and Ottawa, where manufacturing is fundamental. And beyond that sort of, you know, the two big cities and everybody else, there are those regions that are areas that are near the big cities you call connected, and those that are further away, unconnected or less connected. And it, the impact and the importance of manufacturing, in fact, to employment in those less connected connected areas is even more important in the context of the fact that over the last 10 years or so, even as manufacturing has hugely increased the amount of production, you know, employment's actually across the province stayed fairly stable, which Mike, as you were saying, is, is a comment with regard to that, you know, that grounding we have in this province in manufacturing. So maybe you could take apart the regional importance we're also, con you know, sort of conscious of in the context of inclusive growth in all its in manifestations. Yeah, absolutely. So when, when you look at any industry, uh, they have sort of, they, they, they show up in different geographies, right? So if you think of, you know, the high tech industry or finance or banking, they need a, a strong supply of skilled labor, you know, sort of a thick labor pool. So they tend to cluster in big cities. In the Canadian context, I say cities with NHL teams. So your Toronto's, your Vancouver's, your Ottawa's, and the, the sort of the suburban areas. Agriculture tends to be in rural areas. But Ontario has an unusual geography where we have a high number of mid-sized cities where it's not clear, they're, they're kind of that, that middle where, you know, they're not, they're clearly not rural, but they don't necessarily have uh, the labor pool necessary to, you know, have a big five bank go there or, or to have a, a, a Google or Amazon, you know, so take a, take a center like Chatham Kent, you, you know, uh, TD isn't going to open a big office there. Google isn't going to be open a big office there, but they still have about a hundred thousand people. And traditionally, these have been great centers for manufacturing, because manufacturing, first of all, requires a significant uh, land footprint, right? So, so having a manufacturer in downtown Toronto gets, gets really expensive. And secondly, they need to have uh, transportation linkages, you know, be able to get your, your trains and your trucks out. So, you know, again, downtown Toronto doesn't work too well because of uh, congestion and so on. So manufacturers tend to be on this kind of archipelago of, of, uh, of sort of mid-sized uh, cities. And we found that, um, that over the last 20 years, that that manufacturing decline, first of all, employment decline, has been sort of uniform across the province, right? So, you know, Toronto lost about the same proportion of jobs as London, as, as Windsor, and so on. But in your big, bigger cities, those jobs uh, were essentially replaced one-to-one -one with jobs in trucking, construction, and warehousing. So basically, as your Toronto, as your Ottawa built, uh, get built up, the, the, the types of workers that traditionally would have worked in manufacturing just took jobs in, in construction, trucking, and warehousing, and they, they paid roughly the same as the old manufacturing jobs. That, for the most part, didn't happen in your Londons and your Windsors and your, your, your St. Catharines and your Cornwalls, simply because those, those cities weren't growing as much. They weren't uh, creating sort of these uh, spin-off uh, opportunities. So, so that's why manufacturing is particularly important for what we call more isolated communities. Again, it's basically any, any community that's more than 120 kilometers away from an NHL arena. Uh, it's somewhat that's somewhat arbitrary, but that's kind of what the what, what the data shows. And furthermore, in an economic development point, one of the points I always like to make is, is getting a new auto plant will also get you a new Walmart, right? Just because of the spin-off economic activities. But getting a new Walmart doesn't get you a new automotive plant, right? So so manufacturing kind of works as an anchor tenant uh, for economic development. That if you can land. Uh, an auto plant, if you can land uh, someone that's that's making uh, wind turbines, that's going to create, it's going to have a lot of uh, spin-off uh, economic activity, just as Alini described. 
Just to build on Mike's point a little bit, um, I think that statement around kind of the ability to create uh, spin-off industries and additional supply chains is especially true when we're talking about cleaner technologies or, or cleaner growth. These are relatively emerging sectors still, and there's a whole host of innovation literature that points out that there are higher than average rates of knowledge spillovers that uh, that, that basically transcend the boundaries of what one company can capture, um, which is part of the reason why these industries tend to be really well positioned for government investment, because there's a whole host of benefits that can sort of transcend to the entire region and community. Um, but in, in the case of sort of clean tech specifically, you have space to develop entirely new supporting industries uh, that are also going to benefit like our educational institutions, universities, colleges, some of the supply chain transport and logistics pieces where you not only get a Walmart, but you get sort of this whole host of, of spillover benefits and in industries that also pop up around some of these anchor tenants when we're talking about electric vehicle manufacturing plants or wind turbine manufacturers or, or any of the other clean tech manufacturing that could exist in the province. So it, uh, so clean tech manufacturing actually stands out as one of these manufacturing subsectors that has like exponential or, or rather a, a, a multiplier effect when you when you think about the benefits that it's going to be able to generate for for these mid-sized Ontario cities. And that really takes us to the recommendations. And I wanted to ask you about clean tech because it's one of the subsectors or sectors of manufacturing that you emphasize in the paper. And you 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 sort of set out as you move to your recommendations you know, a continuum between laissez-faire and a heavy intrusive government hand and land on a partnership model. But that is one in which government's active in its policy making with regard to which sectors ha have the best economic value and what steps should be taken to encourage th those in Ontario in the context of you know, North American context and, and more broadly. So maybe you can take us to the recommendations and in particular, you look at a couple of models, a couple of models in the United States, in fact, that you think are, if not worth replicating, worth keeping in mind in that, in the context of that more active investment model and, and talking about things like tax policy and things like that. Maybe uh, we could go into that for a little bit. John, do you want to start on that one? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to start there. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of separate into, into two discussions. Um, one, I think, is the, the focus a little bit on some of the tax instruments that we've seen work elsewhere that can speak to some of the uh, specific conditions that different companies have who, who, who happen to be in the manufacturing space. So the nice part about tax policy is that uh, it allows you to tailor individual supports to economic objectives and to kind of the realities that companies face on the ground. Um, the needs of a startup who happens to work in the manufacturing space is dramatically different than a scale up. And ultimately, if you're looking to grow companies, there are certain challenges that a startup is going to face um, that aren't going to be faced if you're also trying to attract larger manufacturing firms or, or retain some of these mid-sized manufacturers manufacturers who serve as anchor tenants in some of these cities. Um, notably, the, the single biggest challenge that manufacturing startups face in Canada is attracting risk capital. Um, risk capital is generally directed towards these, these high reward, um, high risk investments. Uh, clean tech tends to stand out as one of those examples. You're, you're investing in a sector that isn't always as established in a new region, given the fact that it's growing relatively rapidly. So when you want to attract sort of risk capital into this, there are tax instruments that you can use. And ultimately, the one we recommend is something called an investor tax credit um, that can be specifically directed towards clean technology. Now, the way an investor tax credit works is that um, it involves an application process. So a startup will submit an application to the government. It'll otherwise get reviewed, and they'll get a chance to um, either approve the application and thereby lend a, a, an additional tax credit that can... Um, they can help sort of attract investment for, for some of these riskier startup ventures um, while simultaneously allowing the government a, a, a partnership approach so they're not um, so that they can ensure that the, the, the benefits that get given out to these firms are able to sort of support policy objectives. Money gets well spent towards sort of these high potential, high value areas, um, which obviously involves a lot of sort of collaboration with, with individual companies. Now, um, that differs from thinking about the tax instruments you would want to use to attract or retain startups, uh, sorry, to attract or retain scale-ups, who are some of these larger firms, where the challenge isn't necessarily attracting risk capital, but is rather thinking about ways to make the overall environment more attractive to the manufacturer. Uh, and in this case, one of the approaches that we recommend is very targeted and timely corporate tax cuts. Um, 
Now, blanket corporate tax cuts have, have sort of a mixed history of, of being effective at attracting investment. But there is some evidence in the literature to show that these very specific targeted corporate tax cuts aimed at individual subsectors that are desirable um, actually do have some history of, of finding ways to attract investment and also allows the government to be more um, selective and, again, more partner-based in understanding what kinds of companies they want to attract in this case. Um, and one point that I'll note on this is that um, it's, it's, it's important, I think, to make reference to the fact that when we're talking about manufacturing and, and when we're talking about clean growth more broadly, it's still economic growth. All of the same broader economic circumstances that influence growth are still going to influence growth in, in, in the manufacturing sector. Right. And that's where we get into conversations around data management strategies and IP management and even housing affordability that's broadly going to impact the attractiveness to invest in sort of a, a, a particular region or a particular area. So it's important to keep those in mind as well, because ultimately we can employ all the tax instruments that we want, but if, the, if there are other sort of broader, more structural reasons why there's a lack of interest in sort of starting a company or, or, or attracting a, a manufacturer to Canada, then those will need to be addressed as well, because they may stand in the way of achieving some of our objectives. In, in that vein, John, um in addition to some of these macro policy recommendations that you've outlined, um, the, the paper spends a lot of time talking about talent um, in, de in general and a kind of inclusive lens to the talent question in particular. Alini, do you want to just talk a bit about some of the um, equity, diversity, and inclusion considerations around um, yes. manufacturing policy and, and in particular around this question of, of, of talent? Yeah, so I, I, I like to reinforce the, the, the last thing that John just mentioned, which is we can have the best you know, task, tax instruments out there, uh, the best investment, you know, uh, economic capital and whatnot, uh, but manufacturing is also dependent on human capital. And human capital is or, or, you know, highly skilled, especially for a, a, a clean tax uh, uh, manufacturing, we, we require highly skilled uh, workforce. And that is a massive consideration for, for firms to, you know, invest in a specific uh, uh, region or location. The thing with manufacturing is uh, there are several reports indicating that uh, there is a certain uh, uh, difficulty in finding that highly skilled workforce. And one way of uh, uh, you know, bridging that or, 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 or uh, tackling that is uh, ensuring that we expand the pool of available talent out there. Um, manufacturing is in itself a highly male dominant um, workforce sector. And uh, one way to expand that possibility, that pool of talent, it's, it's by ensuring that women uh, are included or have uh, easier path to uh, gain employment, meaningful employment, but also that retain uh, in, 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 the, in the workforce. And there are several ways we can do that. Merely just training women may, might not yield you know, uh, uh, you know, satisfactory results. We have to ensure that manufacturing firms are family appropriate or family uh, friendly better. Uh, we have to ensure that we close the gender wage gap, which is absolutely massive within the sector. Uh, pay parity. We have to ensure that um, we change the sort of discourses, how we talk about manufacturing, the culture within this uh, industry. And uh, perhaps there are also uh, uh, no strategies that can be done, not only in terms of creating a more family-friendly, uh, you know, corporate policies, but also establishing diversity committees within manufacturing firms, uh, ensuring that many times uh, we can create quotas to ensure that women, you know, break the glass, the, the, the glass ceiling out there. We, we are talking about there is a, a very diminutive number of women in uh, corporate boards in manufacturing as well. 
So there is a lot of work to be done to ensure that this uh, growth or this revitalization of manufacturing uh, brings benefits to all Ontarians, uh, to a wider workforce and not the typical workforce that is traditionally uh, male out there. And this is good for the economy, but it, this is also good for the companies themselves, the firms, because they have a wider range of possibility of really uh, uh, getting highly skilled workforce. We can ensure that women, visible minorities, and people who have been traditionally marginalized or excluded from this workforce have the chance to advance, uh, um, you know, economic security, employment opportunities, and things like that. So, uh, and if I could add to that, I think, you know, more work needs to be done to identify the particular bottlenecks of, of why is it that in each of these manufacturing subsectors, because I, I think too often the the solution, the proposed policy solution to this is, well, just get more women in, in more training programs and if you increase the pool. But if that's not the bottleneck, uh, you know, if the bottleneck is somewhere else, you're just going to get, you're setting people up for failure. You're going to get more, more, more women or, or more persons of color or whatever the demographic is. And, you know, those bottlenecks could be a lot of things. So you hear of manufacturers who will, uh, you know, ask their employees to change shifts, go from nine to five to work the night shift or, uh, you know, some of those sort of uh, less family friendly policies that, that Alini's talked about. So this is going to require some efforts uh, on, uh, you know, for the Ontario government and, and for think tanks like ours to really identify those bottlenecks and to come up with smart policies around it. So, so you know, it's, it's easy to identify as like, okay, the, the numbers are showing there's not enough women in particular manufacturing subsectors, but we can't jump to those, necessarily jump to those uh, more straightforward policy solutions because it could be a variety of, uh, of different barriers. Great, Drew, do you have a final question for the authors? I just want to go back to the context. How well do we do? Um, you know, we talked about there are a couple of U.S. initiatives. Um, we've held our own over the last decade. But in terms of policy, who do we look to and, and where do we stand if we were to sum up, um, you know, the state, both of manufacturing, its competitiveness, and the policy parameters around it. I don't know how you can respond to that pithily, we, uh, but, um, you know, but you know, sum it up for us. Uh, you know, the, the paper is just so rich, both in context and in ideas. And, uh, Mike, how would you... Uh, and yeah, maybe, so I, and maybe, maybe the answer to that question, in a way, inserts a degree of kind of urgency for policymakers right. to recognize, um, you know, that we, we can't continue with kind of disparate policies without sort of you know, ensuring we have a coherent strategy around building on our pre-existing strengths. And I like Alini's description of the goal ultimately of revitalizing this crucial sector um, right. in the province of Ontario. Yeah, I, absolutely. So I, I, I think everybody's trying to emulate the Germans. You know, I think that's the, that's the sort of gold standard on this. And there's a lot we can, uh, there was a lot we can learn from them. But I would say that we would have to adapt those for the Ontario circumstances. Uh, just, you know, just simply cutting and pasting policy is, is not going to work. But I absolutely agree with Sean that, you know, it's it's a wide range of, of policies from, from immigration policy, because a lot of our immigration policy now works through the colleges and universities. Uh, through the postgraduate work program, uh, it's it's coming together uh, with, with you know housing policy, uh, childcare policy, and so on, and, and bringing this all together. And I think ultimately that's what this partnership approach is about: is about bringing uh, you know bringing the stakeholders together and discussing what these bottlenecks are. So you know one thing that uh, the paper talks about is supply chain resiliency. You know, we've seen this uh, before. We're seeing this with semiconductors right now. If we can get together uh, as as an industry and academics and so on and identify, OK, what's the next semiconductor? What's the next area where, where something could change and all of a sudden, 
uh, you know, throw our supply chains out of whack. If we can identify those beforehand, that gives us a competitive advantage because we're seeing that right now, again, with semiconductors, that companies that sort of plan for these black swan events are doing very, very well right now. So can we do that? But it all comes to uh, getting together, talking, uh, talking to each other. And a lot of what I say is qualitative research. We're not going to be able to figure this thing out through, through stats can tables. It's going to involve uh, a, lot of, a lot of communication and a lot of interviews, uh, and a lot of information sharing. And in that vein, um, I, you know, thank you so much for your contribution in the form of this paper. I think it um, provides an empirical as well as a sort of normative case for why policymakers ought to concern themselves about the state of manufacturing um, and, and in the province, and, and particularly this question of how do we design place-based policies to ensure that um, you know, the province doesn't continue down the path towards um, growing regional and geographic inequality. So yes. um, readers, whether you're um, policymakers within the Ontario government or the federal government for that matter, or just someone interested in the, the kind of state of Ontario's economy and society, I'd, I'd encourage you to read uh, Mike Alini's and John's paper, which you can find at um, on360.ca. Uh, we were grateful to partner with you and the Smart Prosperity Institute in, in um, commissioning and ultimately publishing this paper. Um, thanks for your contribution uh, with the paper and for participating in today's discussion and for viewers. Uh, we'll be back to you soon um, with more research and more papers and ultimately more videos um, situating a, a broader policy agenda um, rooted in the goal of inclusive growth for the province of Ontario. Thank you so much.